The span of his prolific work parallels the history of independent India. His art springs from life, but does not mirror it. Instead, it's a response to the mood of the nation. A gamut of social experiences blended with his own passionate expression as a sensitive seeker. A painter. A sculptor. An architect. A writer. A man of many talents and even greater resolve. A man who is an inspiration for all those who want to break free of the clutches of circumstance. Satish Gujral, one of modern India's greatest artists. Born in pre-partition West Punjab in 1925, an accident that injured his leg also left him stone deaf at the tender age of eight. A series of surgeries for his leg further confined him to his bed and turned his early life into a living nightmare. One hour, someone asked me the question about my childhood. The answer that filled myself is if I really had a childhood, when I lost my hearing and could not even walk because of a leg injury, I lay in bed. I began to read Iqbal and Halib when I was 12. Once you start living in a world that is created by a poet or a writer, you lose touch with real life. It is what built my personality. The loss of hearing led rapidly to the loss of coherent speech and self-esteem. But Satish's father, Aftar Narayan, was determined to fight the odds. Inspired by some doodles that Satish had done, he explored the idea of introducing him to a graphic language. At 13, Satish got admission to the Mayo School of Arts in Lahore to study applied arts. The curriculum here was designed by Lockwood Kipling, father of the writer Rudyard Kipling. Kipling believed that painting, sculpture and architecture were arts of space and it evolved a syllabus aimed at reviving the Indian crafts tradition, diluted by years of British sovereignty. The years in Mayo gave Satish a new vocabulary that helped him deal with the overwhelming silence in his life. The multiplicity of training that he was exposed to had a lasting impact on his art and molded him into a painter who also sculpts and builds. After finishing with Lahore, I wanted to be only a painter. And so I went to Bombay JJ School for entry. At JJ, in those days, my classmates, her schoolmates, incidentally, happened to be those who later walked the center stage in modern art. There are very few who have been tutored as closely as he has been, you know. I mean, he can draw. Very few people can. I mean, amongst contemporary painters now, I think there are very few who can really draw, who understand drawing the way it should be understood. You can take liberties with these things only after you know what you're taking liberties against, you know. There's no such thing as abstract freedom. And the only abstract freedom that there is is in death then you're free. While studying in Lahore, Satish grew close to his older brother, Inder, 
who went on to become the 12th Prime Minister of India. In this circle of leftist friends injected in him a fervor for social revolution. Many like Ali Sardar Jafri and Fez became great writers and poets whose writings echoed the sentiments of the people during the Indian independence movement. People like Fez, Ahmed Fez, Maghdoum, Mohyuddin, they have been uh, revolutionary poets. They have expressed uh, a lot of very subtle romantic imagery through poetry, uh, wanting freedom, you know what I mean? And when they got freedom, it came like shattered, you know, like Fez writes, Ye daag daag ujala, ye shab gazida sahar, wo intazar tha jiska ye wo sahar to nahi. Bagara. So uh, people have been very deeply influenced by uh, whatever happens in a nation. Like Iqbal writes that uh, nations are born in the heart of poets and die in the hands of politicians. You know? By early 1947, the freedom struggle had reached its peak. The British Empire finally gave in to the demand for independence and quit India. The knotted anguish of partition followed. The amputation of the country saw suffering beyond measure as distraught refugees were torn away from their roots. Satish experienced partition at close quarters and those images of brutality and inhumanity left an indelible impression on him. No outer happening can feed inner compulsion. It must happen to you personally. And so my first beginning as artist was partitioned. I witnessed killing, murder, rape. I painted the man suffering. And people of those days adopted me as their artist. One of his strongest early periods is the works that were devoted to uh, the pathos, anguish that uh, he as an individual and we as a nation experienced as a result of this division. I mean, these are very powerful works which uh, uh, push us to go down to those recesses of our existence which are essentially uh, not expressible in such a simpler fashion. His own personal history of displacement in this juncture, being torn from his roots in Pakistan, made him create the partition series that was so full of angst and anguish and displacement and actually being forcibly pulled out of your cultural, historical roots. Satish's partition series drew a lot of critical acclaim and led him to getting a scholarship to study muralism in Mexico. This new journey of his life seemed full of foreboding, for he was traveling abroad for the first time with no knowledge of English and no ability to hear it. It was the fact of communism that I thought I moved. I thought easel painting was meant for the money. You paint and you end up in a drawing room. So I believed in murals where the public can enjoy it. Mural painting in Mexico was part of a campaign to reassert ethnicity and usher art out of confined gallery spaces into the people's realm. In 1920, with a revolutionary government, the person who was at the time the Minister of Education, whose name was José Vasconcelos, he thought that the best way to make people familiar with their history, with the struggles that um, brought them the benefits of this revolution, they were part of it, that the history was not made only by heroes, but by the average man. And that is what artists muralists like Diego Rivera, Orozco, and Siqueiros as well, introduced in public walls in Mexico. 
It was with Diego Rivera and Sequeiros, the most well-acclaimed mural artists, that Gujral learned the basics of public art. He also developed a strong intellectual bond with Frida Kahlo, the celebrated Mexican artist. Frida had a great interest in Indian culture and spiritual traditions. It was in this phase that Satish shattered all normal perceptions and learned to speak English and Spanish, languages he had not known before he lost his hearing. With his newfound confidence, Gujral returned to India and was commissioned to do a portrait of Lala Lajput Rai, the freedom fighter popularly known as the Lion of Punjab. This portrait had a stormy passage to the Central Hall of Parliament and brought him to the notice of Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister of independent India. A series of portraits were to follow starting with Nehru himself and his daughter, Indira Gandhi. This phase brought him close to the first family, but also brought a new ray of light into his life, Kiran. By marriage was one thing that changed my life and outlook. Earlier, what she did, my frustration was Missing the link with the life and the world. But after I married her, Ken became my bridge with the life. She interpreted everything that was sad. So, having lost the reason to frustrate, my happiness began. It was amazing that, you know, in spite of his not hearing, he was very witty very humorous and uh, had a lot of stories to tell and didn't have any self-pity for himself at all or he didn't seek any and uh, it was very important for me that such a serious and senior artist showed so much interest in me. Honestly the relationship he has with my mother is quite fantastic I mean my mother came from a reasonably well-to-do family. Her father threatened to throw her out of the house if she married this penniless artist. And, uh, but you know, she just took a leap of faith and uh, married him. And with not knowing where the next uh, rupee is going to come from, how they're going to support themselves. And they had, I must say, a real struggle when they started. They used to walk from their house to my uncle's house to eat food. They had no money to pay rent. But I think that's, and of course, she was his muse. She sort of was his alter ego. I mean, he saw the world through her. Though Satish's earnings were meager and life was not easy, marriage brought color and a new zest into his life. The angst and rebellion in him gradually faded as Kiran became his ears and inspired him to break out of his dark style of painting. At this time, Nehruvian industrialization was inspiring the country. Delhi, the capital of modern India, had a number of imposing buildings that ringed the presidential residence on Raisina Hill. Prime Minister Nehru was very supportive of art and, at the behest of Gujral, officially assigned 2% of the cost of government buildings to be dedicated to art. In the Nehruvian phase, what he saw was the industrial forms that were coming up, the big dams and the multi-storied buildings, infrastructure projects, and the whole thing that the Nehruvian era was saying was that we are going to take India to a newer level through industrialization. Impelled by a sense of contributing to the growth of the nation, Gujral turned towards public art. This marked the end of his partition phase catapulting him into a series of mural projects that furthered his preoccupation with architecture and space. The scale of the murals had a dramatic impact on the viewer and, consciously or unconsciously, helped create a niche for art and the artist 
in public consciousness. You know, it, it was like a crucible and a hotbed for constant change. And, you know, at every phase and every stage, the sort of constant need to tamper with success, to not take it as something to be complacent about or to get comfortable in. The Mexican experience taught Satish that native art could be a great source of inspiration in embodying the throbbing chaos of modernity. Satish next turned to a form with spatial and sculptural possibilities. This was followed by voluminous sculptures in burnt wood that had a sinuous muscularity and a primordial quality. These reflected the social psyche that came into being following the emergency of 1975. Possibly the most controversial phase in the history of independent India, when civil liberties were suspended and democracy was shackled. I remember him being very, very disturbed by the situation the country was in at that time. And then he made those brunt words of that phase which were all related to bondage and all kind of restrictions. And if you see that work of his, it's got a lot of belts and, you know, things tied up and ropes and things like that. So that, I remember, was very, very much uh, part of that. In the late 1970s, Gujral began to get restless again. To him, the excitement of new styles and mediums was almost therapeutic and compensated for the absence of sound in his life. Much against advice from all his friends, he decided to open a new vista of creativity and try his hand at architecture. I don't think it even occurred to him that he was not an architect. Architecture is, besides being formed, there are technicalities to it. And I think the sheer confidence that he portrayed made the other person believe that obviously he knows what he's doing and then he sort of found his way how to put that into a reality. Gujral freely exercised his imagination on the three-dimensional canvas that he now adopted. His vision allowed him to synthesize painting, sculpture and architecture into one flowing form. In 1984, Gujral was invited to design the Belgian Embassy in New Delhi. This assignment held enormous challenges that were compounded by an accident on site that led to another series of leg surgeries and a near amputation. He was bedridden for two years. He used to get carried on a stretcher. We had a sort of a stretcher chair made for him, so he used to come to the side and inspect it. And those are things that inspired you that here is a man who's at even at, at, at that point of weakness, never give up. He had that spirit that I've taken on a commitment. I have to see it through. He treated it like a baby. He was fighting against all odds of other people in the profession saying, how can an artist you know, pull off an architectural story? And he did. The Belgian Embassy project created an architectural landmark in modern India. And Gujral became the first non-Belgian to be honored with the Order of the Crown in Architecture by the King of Belgium. When his son took over the architectural reins, Satish embarked on a new series of paintings and entered possibly the most lyrical phase of his career. Musical motifs filled the expanses as if sound had filled his life. Convoluted pain morphed into chromatically rich hues of joy and a riot of colors flared on his canvases. With the turn of the century, Gujral responded to the mood of the nation yet again. T20 cricket had captured the imagination of the country. Gujral too was caught up in the whirlwind of its vibrancy. He discovered the rhythm and precision of the sporting body, the muscle tension of rivalry, the leaps of triumph, and the poetry of motion. Well, cricket is not just a sport for India. Everybody knows that it's a, more of a socio-cultural practice, uh, a passion for people. 
and Gujral has been interested in the way society as a whole reacts to any event, whether it is ritual, whether it is performance. And for him, cricket therefore becomes a performance, a collective performance. At this juncture, the Indian economy started to boom and the nation was being shaped by rapid globalization. Indian contemporary art was attracting international attention. Boundaries were smudging and new collectors, individual and corporate, Indian and international, were beginning to emerge. The auctioning of Indian art by international auction houses gave it a further stamp of international recognition and announced its worldwide arrival. I think art is one thing which definitely uh it's got to do with the spirit, it's got to do with the soul, and it's got to do with the sense of beauty and humanity. But when you see cultures through the window of art, there's a huge binding factor, which is the essence of art. I mean, even if you take something like music, you know, Bade Ghulam Ali said, uh, Khan said that uh, if every home, Shastriya Sangeet was taught classical music, there may not have been a partition. You know? So I think uh, art is a very, very important fragrance of culture. It's a very, very important attribute of a society. And civilizations which are bereft of art, they have no fragrance. Satish Gujral, an artist who embodies the quintessential image of artistic struggle. An artist who emerges a winner despite all his handicaps. Social content has permeated his work, for he has lived through calamities and worked in the face of extreme adversities. No single medium has been able to bind him, because, like his spirit, his art flows freely without being restrained by any barriers. Now it's just his joy of living and being alive and if you see his work, it's like you don't think it's an 85-year-old man painting. And I think he's just full of the uh, joie de vivre to live and to be there. Everyone knows that every person is born,